You've heard the report. A building block of life has been found on a comet, in a star, in a deep sea vent. If you stack the building blocks together, do you get life? Not that anyone has ever seen, but hey, it must have happened once or nothing could have evolved, right? There are scientists who spend their whole careers trying to make the supposedly random act happen. You just never hear about their work. Here is a quick update on their progress from an insider. The Showstack Lab specializes in origin of life research under the direction of Jack W. Showstack. This is what he thinks happened. A molecule form that could copy itself, something like RNA. A bubble of fatty acid formed around the molecule, which then made a copy of itself with nucleotides that filter through the bubble, so the two molecules are attached to each other. When heated just right, the molecules separate. That might happen in an icy pond next to a volcano, where the bubble could circulate between the ice and the hot rocks. Once back in the cool region, the two molecules would make copies of themselves. At the same time, the bubble is picking up fatty acid molecules and growing longer, and a little shaking breaks the bubble into smaller bubbles, each with some of the self-copying molecules inside. Then, some of the RNA-like molecules mutated into ribozyme-like molecules to act as enzymes. What? No way. The ribozymes arise <laughs> and take on such jobs as speeding up reproduction and strengthening the membrane. Next, the organisms might have added protein making to their bag of chemical tricks. <laughs> Complex systems of RNA catalysts begin to translate RNA into protein proteins take on a wide range of tasks within the bubbles. <laughs> the proteins start to replace RNA in metabolism and copying genes. Later, the organisms would have learned to make DNA. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks to its superior stability, DNA takes over from RNA, whose role changes to act as a bridge between DNA and proteins. Oh my God. Bacteria spread over the earth and evolution begins. <laughs> wow. Okay, that is the scenario. Here is reality in the biochemistry labs brought to us by Dr. Franklin M. Harold, Professor Emeritus, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Colorado State University, and Affiliate Professor, Department of Microbiology, University of Washington Health Sciences Center. He has been studying cell biology for over 50 years. Researcher William F. Martin called him a grand master of cellular workings and bioenergetics in a review of Harold's 2014 book, In Search of Cell History, The Evolution of Life's Building Blocks, published by the University of Chicago Press. These are excerpts from the chapter titled Ultimate Riddle, Origin of Cellular Life, where he examines at length the current state of origin of life research. Over the past 60 years, Dedicated and skillful scientists have devoted much effort and ink to the origin of life, with remarkably little to show for it. Quoting research biologist Radu Popa, Ph.D. in microbiology, from his 2004 book, Searching for the Definitions and Origin of Life, So far, no theory, no approach, no set of formulas, and no blackboard scheme has been found satisfactory in explaining the origin of life. Unquote. At the conclusion of a century of science, whose great glory is the discovery of how living things work, there is something downright disgraceful about this confession, an intimation that despite our vast knowledge and clever technology, there may be questions that exceed our grasp. But its truth is indisputable. Life's origin has been most ardently pursued by chemists, apparently on the unspoken premise that once the molecular building blocks are on hand, cellular organization will take care of itself. That premise is surely incorrect. Modern cells do not assemble themselves from preformed constituents, and they would not have done so in the past. In truth, there is presently no persuasive hypothesis to account for the emergence of protocells from the primal chaos. The notion that the first protocells assembled themselves spontaneously from a generous menu of precursor molecules conveniently supplied by abiotic chemistry 
or imported by way of comets and meteorites, is now widely recognized as simplistic and effectively has been abandoned. Among its most cogent critics are experienced masters of the art of prebiotic synthesis, who are well aware of the shortcomings of many of the proposed routes and of the wide gap between the range of molecules that living things employ and those that can be made in the laboratory. The fact is that chemists have encountered insuperable difficulties in generating a working replicator, and many have expressed doubts about the project. It is at least incumbent upon proponents of its spontaneous genesis to explain how the correct monomers could have been selected from the prebiotic clutter, how a sufficient concentration of monomers was maintained, where the energy came from, and how the replicator evaded the tendency of polymers to break down by hydrolysis. A decade ago, a hot topic for debate was which came first, replication or metabolism? That issue has not been resolved, but has been largely superseded by the recognition that neither of them, by itself, can take one far along the road to life. It is simply not credible to claim that anything beyond the most rudimentary kind of replication or metabolism could have arisen in free solution. The origin of the principles that govern cellular operations today, genes specifying proteins and all the apparatus that this requires, remains quite unknown and points beyond the capacity of present-day biochemistry and biophysics. For the present, we are in limbo. The natural path from simple cosmic molecules to cells, from chemistry to biology, remains undiscovered. Where we should look for illumination, I cannot say. The difference between a puzzle and a mystery is that the former can be solved within the framework of known principles, while the latter cannot. In the end, the origin of life remains a mystery that passes understanding. We may still be missing some essential insight. So every path has been explored over the last 60 years, and it is now obvious that the origin of life by chemistry is impossible. Still, you know the Shostak lab, Reto Popa, Franklin Harold, and the others will not quit working because if they ever say, stop, this is as hopeless as trying to jump across the widest part of the Grand Canyon, it would open science to the supernatural again, the way it was before Darwin. As Franklin Harold wrote, a nudge from the divine would help us clear some very high hurdles, but once that possibility is admitted, there will be no place to stop and soon the settled principle of evolution by natural selection would be thrown into doubt. When the scientific method of experimentation is applied to the origin of life by chemicals as described here, and also to make a revolution, the result is always a big zero. Just thought you'd like to know.